Bom dia a todos. Nós vamos dar início. Eu gostaria de chamar para compor a mesa da abertura é, o professor Fernando Landgraf, que é o diretor do Instituto de Pesquisas Tecnológicas, e o professor Paulo Saldiva, que é o uh, diretor do Instituto de Estudos Avançados. E eu tinha visto aqui a professora Sara... Chegando. Professora Sara, para também compor a mesa, como uh, nossa uh, vice-diretora do Departamento de História da FEFELESH. Onde está? Ah, professor Piqueira, claro. <risos> professor Antônio Piqueira, que está, está aqui, desculpa, que é o diretor da Escola Politécnica. Organizar o setor de bengalas fica à direita. É um negócio super avançado. Eu não reconheço sem a roupa de da bicicleta. Pois é, professor, é um processo civilizatório. Né? Muito bem. Uh, então, uh, composta a mesa, uh, vou me apresentar. Eu sou o Gildo Magalhães, dirijo o Centro Interunidades História da Ciência da USP que foi é, criado há praticamente 30 anos atrás, é, numa feliz iniciativa do professor Shoso Motoyama. E hoje esse centro tem a oportunidade de realizar é, este simpósio, que é um evento USP de História da Ciência e da Tecnologia. É uma grande satisfação para nós que organizamos temos uma centena de trabalhos que serão apresentados em sessões temáticas, e esses trabalhos vieram de 17 unidades da USP, inclusive de camp fora desse aqui do Butantã. Temos trabalhos que vêm de Ribeirão Preto, de São Carlos, Piracicaba e da USP Leste. E é, também teremos, durante o evento, duas mesas redondas que estão é, anunciadas no programa, uma sobre a, é, uma discussão sobre política científica e tecnológica nessa época de cortes, e outra sobre historiografia da ciência e da tecnologia. É, eu acho que esse interesse é, sem dúvida, é, resultado que nos mostra que há interesse por parte da comunidade uspiana é, em uma disciplina que é interdisciplinar, que é a história da ciência e da tecnologia. Temos também a feliz participação é, dos dois irmãos mais velhos, que já estavam aqui antes da USP mudar, que são exatamente o Instituto Putantan e o Instituto de Pesquisas Tecnológicas. Tudo isto é, também é um indicativo de que nós poderíamos aproveitar melhor uma simbiose entre tantos campos de ciências ditas exatas é, e as ciências humanas para construirmos é, uma reflexão sobre essa atividade que se tornou aquela que nós presenciamos no nosso dia a dia, desde o celular até as consultas médicas. E é, a figura que muitos devem estar achando um pouco estranha, que nós é, escolhemos para é, ilustrar 
o nosso evento, é uma das uh, esculturas da Elizabeth Nobling, foi professora da FAO, e que estão na Torre do Relógio. Né? Nós passamos sempre na Torre do Relógio sem olhar muito para o que está lá. É, e justamente são 12 figuras que estão esculpidas nessa torre e foi escolhida exatamente a que representa as ciências sociais. E, de acordo com a leitura da própria escultora, é, é, ela quis representar as forças agressoras que emergem de um caos em contraposição às forças protetoras que seguram uma criança. É, e, na base do nosso relógio da USP, está a frase que também é, foi colocada no simpósio, que é uma frase de um ex-reitor, Miguel Reale, é, de que, é, no universo da cultura, o centro está em toda parte. Pelo menos é uma frase de reitor que a gente endossa, não é? é eu é, queria, nesse início, é, louvar o inestimável trabalho que tiveram a comissão científica e a comissão executiva deste evento. Essas pessoas estão nominadas no caderno de resumo, mas a elas se acrescentaram mais três, depois que nós já tínhamos feito a impressão, e que trabalharam bastante. Eu quero citar, então, nominalmente, o Alexandre Ricardi, a Luana Tamano e a Marilda Nagamini. E eu sou muito grato ao apoio que recebemos de algumas unidades da USP, entre elas a Escola Politécnica, o Instituto de Física, o Instituto de Matemática e Estatística, o Departamento de Música da ECA, que vai nos brindar com um concerto no fim do dia de hoje, e, como eu falei, o apoio também dos nossos irmãos mais velhos, o IPT e o Butantan. Eu não mencionei nesta lista o IEA, porque o Instituto de Estudos Avançados, mais é, do que um apoio que também tem sido dado, é, o IEA tem sido o nosso grande parceiro no fortalecimento do Centro de História da Ciência. Há um ano atrás, é, demonstrando uma imediata generosidade acadêmica e uma irrestrita confiança de que nós nos dedicaríamos à pesquisa, o IA acolheu o nosso grupo de pesquisa Cronos com uma série de atividades, entre elas esta de hoje. E, em vista disso, eu gostaria de passar a palavra ao professor Paulo Saldiva, que é o diretor do IEA, para fazer a sua saudação e dar o início oficial do evento. Obrigado, professor. É uma enorme honra estar aqui. É, o, agradeço muito a oportunidade de permitir que o IEA participe desse desse conjunto de atividades sobre a história da medicina e queria também história da ciência e tecnologia é um desculpe é um certo viés médico só eu tenho de achar que né, é, como eu disse há evidências sólidas que a NASA demonstrou de vida inteligente fora da faculdade de medicina isso causou uma surpresa muito grande para nós é, membros daquela igreja unidade e também queria saudar nesse momento a presença do patrono da minha turma da Faculdade de Medicina, o professor Isaías Rau, que por alguns motivos, não sei exatamente quais, né, o professor não pôde estar presente à nossa formatura, nos anos de 1977, mas que estava presente no momento que nós nos aventuramos no mundo profissional como exemplo. Tê-lo como exemplo foi muito importante para toda aquela turma, professor. Bom... História da ciência 
e da tecnologia é cada vez mais necessária. Não só pelo encantamento de descobrirmos o que aconteceu, mas principalmente porque ela pode recuperar exemplos de situações virtuosas num mundo cada vez mais desprovido de princípios e virtudes. É, lembrar que houve momentos diferentes no Brasil, a presença de pessoas que atuaram com idealismo, instituições que se criaram imaginando um Brasil melhor, e isso é absolutamente necessário é, no, no planejamento de futuro do Brasil. É, se o presente não nos ajuda, é melhor que a gente volte no passado e busque o caminho para reencontrar valores perdidos. É, o diálogo entre a ciência e tecnologia, as, das ciências naturais, as chamadas ciências duras, ela não pode ser desprovido de princípios que são basicamente melhor estudados pelas ciências humanas. Não dá para imaginar né, que o fato de você... Né, é, é, é muito frequente essa distinção a ponto de dizer que ciências humanas não são ciência, então que, alguns governantes que dizem que se faz ciência inútil, né? é, é, que se gasta dinheiro de pesquisa em ciências inúteis, como se, primeiro, é, o fato de que as ciências humanas, por vezes, trabalham com é, pressupostos ou escolas pré-definidas ou abordagens pré-definidas, é, excluísse o fato de que também as ciências naturais assim também o fazem. É, mas é, é, eu vou citar um exemplo, a estátua foi muito importante, eu mostrar a virtude protegendo um bebê. Eu perdi os ligamentos do joelho numa queda de bike. Então, eu, na bike eu viro gente, mas para andar e subir dessa escada, eu preciso desse grupo que nos fez colocar nesse núcleo é, de mobilidade. É, é Aqui colocaram as pessoas, uma com mobilidade prejudicada e outra com mobilidade e cognição prejudicada, que é o meu caso. É, 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 toda vez que eu tenho que subir ou descer uma escada, eu tenho que analisar as informações multidisciplinares que vêm do meu tendão, dos meus receptores de dor, dos fusos neuromusculares, da visão, do sistema vestibular, do cerebelo, para poder dar o passo certo. Se eu estiver caindo, esse conjunto de informações vai me sinalizar, salve o joelho, senão vai estourar tudo de novo. Se eu tiver um bebê no colo, como no caso da estátua, a depender dos princípios que eu tiver, eu vou salvar o bebê, mesmo que com isso eu perca o joelho. Então, é, a multidisciplinaridade não basta. É, é, você tem que fundir e criar princípios que é o que falta hoje na definição de políticas, princípios maiores, hierárquicos, que definam o pensamento de fato, é, não de colocar tudo como culinária japonesa no mesmo prato, mas como a bactéria faz, a bactéria funde. E o produto dessa fusão de informações moleculares gera um novo ser com propriedades que não são a soma das partes que as constituíram. Isso já foi abordado na filosofia aristotélica, já foi abordado, mas hoje na vida real é cada vez mais importante. E eu posso garantir, especialmente na área que melhor conheço, na área da saúde, que é cada vez mais necessário o, o, o espírito de a presença de humanidades e princípios na prática. Ou seja, é, não basta ser um Dr. House. Eu, nós temos que também é, modificar a abordagem em relação ao paciente, entender de coisas como psicologia, como ética, como fatores das ciências humanas. Mas também se você pega, por exemplo, um cirurgião ortopédico, que recebe o quinto caso de trauma grave que vem do mesmo é, região da cidade, onde te, e você, então, você tem que saber a partir da, do produto daquela, daquele problema, quais são as medidas para você intervir e saber o que está que acontecendo naquele lugar, o que é, que é necessário para prevenir aquilo. Muito difícil. E esse, esse encontro de, de história da ciência e tecnologia, ele é um exercício objetivo da fusão de áreas que vão falar de coisas é, 
muito, por vezes muito objetivas, muito numéricas, muito sólidas, e tentar analisá-las e como eles mudar o mundo que nos cerca, como é que influenciaram a, a sociedade e como o que nós somos depende do que foi feito no passado e como nós devemos proceder assim para o amanhã. Falei demais. A ausência da minha esposa impede que eu, que eu breque, porque basta ela um olhar para saber quando eu, eu devo ficar quieto. Isso é uma, é uma Essa linguagem não verbal é dominada por mim há, há 34 anos. Mas eu queria só dizer que eu é, é um, estou muito feliz de que isso esteja ocorrendo. E agradeço muito ao professor Gildo pela oportunidade. Ele veio propor uma... Uh, uma interação entre o EA e o grupo de, que ele dirige e é, foi um trouxe para a gente um presente um presente porque esse grupo talvez represente um dos que mais encarnam a, 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 justificam a, a presença de um, a existência de um instituto de estudos avançados da USP ele faz a fusão que as bactérias fazem e o produto, eu espero que seja muito diferente e com certeza melhor do que a soma das partes. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, professor Paulo Saldiva. É, nós vamos, daqui a poucos minutos, ter a conferência do professor é, Robert Fox. Mas eu gostaria de fazer um pequeno desvio extra programa. Antigamente, a USP abrigava nos barracões onde hoje fica a Alcane, a agência USP é, de cooperação internacional, abrigava ali a FUNBEC, que era a Fundação Brasileira para o Desenvolvimento do Ensino de Ciências, e que foi idealizadora de vários produtos comercializados. Essa Fumbec, infelizmente, deixou de existir em 1988, mas, há uns 40 anos atrás, é, a Fumbec fez um acordo com a editora Abril, que era para comercializar os cientistas, uma coleção de 50 kits com experiências fundamentais de ciências como física, química e biologia. Os conjuntos da FUNBEC foram, então, vendidos nas bancas de jornal do país. Isso foi um verdadeiro sucesso. Consta que 3 milhões desses kits foram parar nas escolas e nos lares brasileiros. Uma pessoa que foi vital para esse empreendimento foi um médico bioquímico, professor da USP, aposentado compulsoriamente em 1968 pela ditadura militar. Ele é, foi uma pessoa inovadora, formadora de equipes, ele ganhou notoriedade, muitos prêmios pela sua carreira científica. Hoje ele está a caminho dos seus 91 anos e, mesmo aposentado, é ativo no Instituto Butantan. Eu não vou falar nada dessa carreira científica, que é muito conhecida, mas eu queria recordar que, é, justamente nesses kits, vinha um fascículo, umas 20 páginas, sobre a vida, as controvérsias e a época de cada cientista ligado à experiência específica daquele kit. Então, esses conjuntos de experiência, eh, além da, das próprias experiências, redundaram em mais de 800 páginas de um esforço que ainda não foi igualado para divulgar aquilo que é o motivo desse nosso encontro de hoje, que é a dimensão histórica da ciência e da tecnologia. Eu tenho a impressão de que a pessoa de que eu estou tratando e que recebeu tantas honrarias por sua dedicação à ciência, eu acho que ela nunca recebeu nenhuma, pela sua contribuição, à história. E, como nós aqui somos fãs de história, eu gostaria, portanto, é, nesse momento, 
de chamar para receber uma homenagem muito singela, é, o professor Isaías Hall. Por favor, professor. Eu ainda tenho os meus fascículos todos encadernados dessa época. Muito bem. Então, é, com isso, nós, de fato, vamos dar início às atividades. Agradeço aos que compuseram a mesa. E é, po podem retornar aos seus lugares. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Boa sorte. Obrigado. Certo. Obrigado. Bem, é, nós vamos dar, então, prosseguimento com a, a palestra do professor Robert Fox, que é uma autoridade é, britânica das mais conhecidas na história da ciência. Não, eu tenho que ficar embaixo. 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 É, o professor Fox escreveu é, muitos livros, entre eles A Cultura da Ciência na França, O Sábio e o Estado e, finalmente, Ciências Sem Fronteiras, que não foi pego aqui do programa similar de governo, o título. É, nesses livros, ele examina a ciência, a tecnologia, a cultura e política na França desde o século XVIII até a Segunda Guerra Mundial. É, entre também várias outras publicações de livros e artigos, é, há um que está sendo bastante utilizado, que é o... Oxford Handbook of the History of Physics, o manual Oxford para a História da Física. Em 2006, o professor Fox recebeu do Ministério da Cultura da França o título de Cavaleiro da Ordem de Artes e de Letras e, em 2015, ele recebeu o altamente prestigioso prêmio da medalha Georges Sarton. O professor Fox se formou em Física, em Oxford, em 1961. Ainda nesse campo, ele fez o um mestrado em 1965, mas mudou para a História, onde ele conseguiu uh, rapidamente o doutorado uh, em História Moderna de Oxford, em 1967, uh, que foi orientado pelo historiador muito conhecido, Alistair Crombie. A tese do professor Fox se intitulava O Estudo das Propriedades Térmicas dos Gases em Relação à Teoria Física desde Montgolfier até Regnaud. Ele deu aulas na Universidade de Lancaster entre 66 e 88, primeiro como assistente e depois como é, professor titular de História da Ciência. Entre 1986 e 88, o professor Fox viveu na França, onde foi diretor do Centre de Recherche en Histoire de Science et de Technique, na Cidade das Ciências e da Indústria, La Villette, em Paris. Depois, ele ainda se tornou o vice-diretor do Museu de Ciências de Londres, em 1988, ele se tornou professor titular 
de História da Ciência na Universidade de Oxford, aposentando-se em 2006. Desde essa época, o professor Fox tem sido um professor visitante em diversas uh, faculdades e universidades dos Estados Unidos, só para citar algumas, Johns Hopkins, a East Carolina, Oregon, e também no exterior, onde ele foi professor visitante da Universidade Técnica Tcheca, em Praga. Em 2013, ele foi o Distinguished Fellow da Fundação do Patrimônio da Química, em Filadélfia. O professor Fox foi presidente eh, e criador da Sociedade Europeia para a História da Ciência, que ele fundou em 2003. Depois, ele ainda foi o presidente da Sociedade Britânica de História da Ciência e, posteriormente, da União Internacional de História e Filosofia da Ciência. Entre 2008 e 2014, o professor Fox editou Notes and Records, que é a revista da Royal Society para a História da Ciência. Estamos, portanto, muito honrados em receber o professor Robert Fox. Well, it's a great pleasure to be back in Brazil and to be invited by my very good friend, Julio Santos, and I want to thank him for making this visit possible and, <clears throat> of course, to thank you, all of you, for your hospitality. It's a great privilege to be here and an enormous pleasure for me. Now, what I'm going to talk about is a fairly recent interest of mine. It follows uh, an interest that I have in international science, <clears throat> particularly in the late 19th and through the 20th centuries. I'm going to be talking about what I call the age of exhibitions, which I think, and by that I mean the age of international universal exhibitions, which began for me probably, in, I suppose, in the mid-19th century. And many would say it would end with the First World War. I, at the end of what I have to say, I will try to argue a little bit against that view and argue that the age of exhibitions could, in fact, still be with us. But anyway, uh, timekeepers of science and empire, and I want to begin really in the middle of the uh, period that I've outlined, and that is in 1901. Memories of the Pan American Exposition of 1901 in Buffalo, in upstate New York, people will remember it for one tragic event, and that was the assassination of the American president, uh, William McKinley. And inevitably, the exhibition was overshadowed by that shooting by an anarchist. And I think the exhibition has been overshadowed uh, by that event as well ever since. But I begin with the uh, Buffalo exhibition, for other reasons. By other, any standards, it was a um, spectacular event. It inspired any number of popular songs. And for the eight million people who attended, uh, there were six months of extravagant spectacle and entertainment. It was the sort of thing that people remembered for the rest of their lives. Uh, in his speech at the exhibition, which he delivered the day before he was shot, McKinley uh, caught the mood. Exhibitions, he said, exhibitions like the one in Buffalo were the markers of the inexorable march of civilization. They were a sort of, uh, uh, on, this was a sort of ongoing and almost organic process. Um, exhibitions, in his words, and I'm using those words in my title, exhibitions for McKinley were the timekeepers of progress. Now, 
By 1901, then, we're in the, the pinnacle of what I'd call the age of exhibitions, and that kind of rhetoric that McKinley used had become absolutely uh, routine <clears throat> in speeches, in exhibition after exhibition, uh, right through to the First World War, there was that same emphasis on progress <clears throat> and particularly on the inevitability of progress and on the assumption that the proper measure of progress lay in the accumulated achievements of science and technology. And McKinley followed that tradition. He looked back in 1901, he looked back to a 19th century that had bequeathed the steam engine, the telegraph, rapid travel, and most recently and most pertinently for Buffalo, the new technological marvel of electricity. For almost 20 years by 1901, electric lighting, electric power had been the centerpieces of any international exhibition. Uh, electricity had already stolen the show at the Great Paris Exhibition of 1889, again in Prague in 1891, the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. But Buffalo was determined to go one better, to go one better with its electric tower, well over 100 meters high. At night, a beacon of 4,000 incandescent lamps, uh, searchlights, cutting through the, the night sky dramatically. So that was one staple of what I call exhibition rhetoric. This belief in progress, in science, which was both the motor and, if you like, the touchstone, the measure of progress. <clears throat> The other staple of exhibition rhetoric was what I would call universalism. Uh, it's not actually a term that's used at the, at the time, but by that I mean the idea that exhibitions were a place where the peoples of the world could come together in a spirit of peace and cooperation. Uh, cooperation that again, in McKinley's words, cooperation that would advance the highest and best interests of all humanity. Now actually the Buffalo exhibition wasn't uh, quite universal in that sense. It was a Pan-American exhibition. It was an exhibition for countries of what was called the Western continent. But within uh, the Pan-American world it had all the conventional universalist ideals. There's that mingling of nations, that erosion of barriers, this idea of mutual support between countries and communities and so on. Um, and the barriers that were lowered, or that the exposition wanted to lower, the barriers were mainly between North and South America. In the words of the exhibition's promoters, the exposition would show the people of Latin America that their northern neighbor, essentially the USA, was a comrade and a friend and not a tyrant or an oppressor. Well, as this symbol, like almost the trademark of the Buffalo exhibition reminded visitors, the USA was offering the hand of friendship to the South and it was doing everything to please even to the point of imposing a rather curious architectural style that it was thought would please Latin American visitors. The style was said to be modeled on the uh, Spanish-American mission buildings of the old Spanish Empire. There were red roofs, these arcades, there were tall, these tall twin belfries that gave the impression of a, a cathedral. Now, it's all rather incongruous in the northern latitudes of Buffalo, which is right up against the Canadian border, but the principle was that it would make visitors from the former Latin American uh, colonies uh, feel at home. And tentatively, uh, Latin America uh, grasped the hand. The government of Chile, in particular, invested heavily in the exhibition. It published a substantial book about uh, Chile, in English of course, the resources of Chile, it built a rather fine Chilean pavilion 
And between them, Chile and Mexico, Mexico also invested heavily. Chile, Mexico, and the USA carried off most of the prizes. So it's not, uh, I think you could say at first sight, it looks as though the North's overture, this charm offensive, that it actually worked. And yet it's not hard to show how fragile and shallow in some ways this rhetoric of progress universalism really was. Now, it's certainly true that in Latin America, many saw the hand of friendship as perfectly genuine. They were happy to see their countries uh, represented in the shop window that Buffalo offered. They were happy to show off their natural resources, the opportunities for immigration, for inward investment, and so on. Others, though, saw threats. They saw the threat of American capitalism, or immediately, and remember this is the, the, the date, 1901, they saw the threat from the USA's colonial aspirations. Following the Spanish-American War of 1898, first Cuba, then the Philippines had fallen under US control, so there were inevitable questions. I mean, could the Americans be trusted? Where next might they have other territories in view for colonization, or at least for extending their sphere of influence. And it wasn't just national interests that were at work, not just US interests. There were civic interests as well. Uh, these were always discreet, they're always veiled, but the interests of Buffalo itself are unmissable. As a city, Buffalo was uniquely placed to exploit the proximity of the Niagara Falls, uh, the falls themselves, the high voltage alternating current uh, transmission lines that brought electricity to Buffalo 40 kilometers away. So Buffalo had its own ambitions and above all it had the ambition to outshine its great rival in the Great Lakes area and that was Chicago. Now Chicago was a troubled city in many ways, constantly troubled by corruption, labor, labor disputes and so on. It had also suffered a disastrous fire in 1871, but as Thomas Hughes shows in his book, Networks of Power, it was, Chicago was a, a pacemaker in urban electrification. It was, if you like, the embodiment of the vibrant, modern uh, American uh, city. And it was precisely the sort of city that Buffalo also aspired to be. It was a city, Chicago was a city with enormous, and I'm using Hughes's language here, enormous technological momentum. And it was that technological momentum in Chicago that uh, the, 19, uh, the 1893 Chicago Exposition what set out to display. Now the Chicago exhibition was all about progress, of course, like all the others. And that progress was proclaimed through the, the brilliance, the whiteness of the exhibition buildings, hence the nickname for the, for the site, the White City. And if Buffalo was to edge ahead of Chicago, which it wanted to do, if it, want, it had to do something different, where Chicago had offered whiteness, uh, it had offered the relentless cold brightness of arc lighting, Buffalo went for color and subtlety. Buffalo offered the warmth, the controllability that you could only get now in 1901, though not in 1893, that you could only get now with incandescent lamps. And so Buffalo was all about color. So there are multiple realities, multiple interests, if you like, behind the, this rather high-minded uh, disinterested uh, exhibition rhetoric of progress and universalism. Now, contrasts of that kind had been part and parcel of exhibition culture right from the start. They were certainly there at the time of the first of the truly international universal exhibitions in 1851. This is the great exhibition of the works of all nations held in London uh, in the area known as Hyde Park. Uh, the exhibition was held in the great Crystal Palace. This was a vast building. It's almost half a kilometer long, uh, 40 meters high, and it was by far the largest building in London 
at the time. So vast, in fact, that trees, the trees in Hyde Park, were simply built into the, into the Crystal Palace. It, the, the Crystal Palace was built round them. And the Crystal Palace itself, the building itself, was a, a masterpiece, a scientific and technological masterpiece. If you look at those very fine uh, load-bearing columns, the, the fine, they, they were breathtaking. They were seen as breathtaking at the time. They were made possible by recent advances in the casting of iron. And, and you take the whole vast expanse of glass that's made possible by using uh, cast plate glass that had been introduced and used for the first time only three years before. So that made the building itself part of the show. It was a sort of physical embodiment, if you like, of that, i come back to this, that exhibition watchword of progress. And as for universalism, well, that was expressed uh, eloquently, I think, in the official title. This was an exhibition that was to be of the works of industry of all nations. But just as in Buffalo, 50 years later, other things, local agendas, were in play as well. It's true that the uh, ex exhibition, Crystal Palace, was open to all nations. You couldn't say that all nations actually came, but about 30 did. And, of course, in addition, virtually all the British colonies came. And what the organisers intended and what uh, they knew was that the Great Exhibition was first and foremost a celebration. It was a celebration of a century in which Britain had become, as we like to say at that time, the workshop of the world. It, it had become a country so prosperous, so stable, that all those working class unrest, all that working class unrest, discontent, even the great revolutionary movements of 1848, they passed Britain by. They left no effect at all. In the words of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, in the words of Prince Albert, who was the, really the conceiver and the chief promoter of the Great Exhibition, uh, the exhibition would make clear to the world Britain's role as the world's industrial leader. The world was being invited to an arena of friendly rivalry, but at the same time, to pay homage to Britain. Well, no wonder Queen Victoria was charmed by it. The day of the opening, she wrote in her diary, it was one of the greatest and most glorious of our lives. And she came back 30 times. Well, predictably, France, Britain's great rival in all things, France, followed suit with its exhibitions in 1855 and then another one in 1867. Now, France, like Britain, had its interests, of course, and here I think it's important to note that the French exhibition was a state affair. It was entirely financed by the state, and I think that showed in the tone of the exhibition. The 1851 exhibition had, been, uh, had certainly received a state subsidy, but it was planned to make a profit, and it did make a profit, and that whole area, some of you may know, uh, in South Kensington, the area of the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum, the Victorian Albert Museum, the area of Imperial College, that was all developed with the profits from the 1851 exhibition. The Paris exhibition made a loss, a big loss, but that didn't matter because the state took care of the loss. What mattered for the promoter of the exhibition, the Emperor Napoleon III, was not the profit. What mattered was that he should be able to present himself in 1867 as being surrounded by kings and queens and presidents and so on, and that he was the equal of any of them. And that mattered because this gathering of world leaders concealed Napoleon's many domestic anxieties. He'd come to power uh, he'd become emperor, in fact, through a power grab that was, I'd, I'd say, to say the least, sort of pretty, of doubtful legitimacy. He had this conformist, rather conservative Second Empire, which was constantly vulnerable to attacks from the liberal camp. And Napoleon was vulnerable 
uh, most recently, in fact, to worse than that, to ridicule and humiliation following the fiasco of his Mexican campaign. The Mexican emperor, Maximilian, a puppet of France, was shot just a couple of months after the exhibition began. Well, for a regime in trouble, what better way than to proclaim that all was well? What better strategy than to outdo the British in particular? And not just to outdo the British at their own game, but to articulate a distinctively French form of progress. And for that, just to make that point, I just want to look at two exhibits. 1851, the Crystal Palace, the technological showstopper was James Naismith's Steam Hammer. Now this was just a huge, a huge thing. Um, it's huge, powerful, but so precise, so precisely engineered that if you lowered the hammer onto an egg in a glass, it would just, it could be made just to crack the shell of the egg without crushing it. So it's a very precise piece of engineering, but technologically it's pretty straightforward and pretty uh, traditional. Four years later, though, in Paris, the French showpiece was something very different. The French showpiece was just a little cluster of tiny, 12 tiny ingots of a new wonder element. And that wonder element was aluminium. Now, aluminium had been produced in the 1820s, but it was only now, in the mid-1850s, that you could prepare aluminium in its, pr in its pure form and in significant quantities, though still very small quantities. And when it went on show for the first time in the 1855 exhibition, it was seen as so scarce, so valuable, that Napoleon insisted it should be shown in the section of the exhibition devoted to the crown jewels. It was a precious metal. And what made aluminium the wonder of the age, of course, was its lightness. It was so light that if you made a beam, uh, the, the beam of a chemical balance, this is the first object to be made in aluminium, if you made a beam of the, a balance in aluminium, you'd be able to weigh down to the 20th of a milligram. And for the luxury market, well, there were other things on show. You could produce ultralight jewellery. This is a bracelet in aluminium on the left. Uh, or you could use al aluminium as an alloy with copper, and, that had, and the result had the appearance of gold. And so you have those objects on the right, those luxury ob objects, a chalice and a little cup, that look and were presented as um, rarities and special objects comparable with, with gold. And most importantly, I mean, that's really what mattered, uh, the aluminium was French. It was the product of a laboratory, the work of a chemist, Henri Saint-Clair de Ville, so that on the French side you had Saint-Clair de Ville, the French hero, a brilliantly qualified academic chemist using refined techniques and so on. And on the other side you had James Naismith, self-taught, unlettered, an engineer in the mould of Britain's favourite technological hero, James Watt. So in setting aluminium on a pedestal, as they did, the French were making a statement. They were making a statement about France's strength, France's, and that France's future lay in developments in science, laboratory science. Britain came across as rooted in the past, the old machine age, the age of Na Naismith's workshop, the shop floor, the dirty shop floor, and as many contemporary observers contemporaries observed both in Britain and in France, Britain looked as though it was being left behind. Well, all that just really to say something pretty obvious, that as historians we need to look behind the rhetoric, those key words of progress and universalism, they were broad, they were flexible enough to accommodate interests that were anything but universal. Now, I've mentioned the agendas of Chicago and, and um, Buffalo and so on, but there were many others. I mean, you can see that if you look through the number of e international exhibitions uh, by decade, you're looking at sort of 30 or 40 every decade leading up to the First World War. And there are uh, hidden interests and so on in every one of them. 
Those local interests, those local agendas, they were always camouflaged, they were unspoken, but they're not hard to uncover. Just take one exhibition, 1889 in Paris. The president of France, Sadi Carnot, who incidentally is not the uh, physicist Sadi Carnot, this is the nephew of uh, Sadi Carnot, the, the physicist. Um, and this is what he says in his address. It's the usual uh, exhibition rhetoric. He talks about the human spirit rediscovering its initiative and so on. He talks about science taking flight, steam and electricity transforming the world and so on. But then he goes on to talk about this being a century that had to be celebrated. The problem there was which century was this? Well, in 1889, looking back a century took you back to 1789. And so the century, in fact, that Carnot was talking about was the century that had been inaugurated by the French Revolution. Well, it's not surprising that um, Queen Victoria had certainly not the slightest intention of attending the 1889 exhibition, and in, fe in fact, Britain's presence was very low-key. And it's not surprising also that a very distinguished group of aesthetes, musicians, writers, artists, and so on, petitioned against the building of the great symbol of the 1889 exhibition, which was the Eiffel Tower. For them, the Eiffel Tower was a folly. It was an intrusion on the Parisian skyline. In fact, the fact is that for them, no matter where the tower was located, Progress could never be presented, represented, measured by a material object. It certainly could not be represented, and this is part of their public response, by the fantasies of a machine builder, an engineer. That's the sort of rhetoric that's directed against the Eiffel Tower. But of course, it was precisely because the Eiffel Tower was uh, a modern material object. The fact that it was an intrusion, it's precisely that that made it serve the purposes of somebody like the President of the French Republic, made it serve the purposes of this secular, progressive uh, Third Republic. And size mattered as well. In that little image of Eiffel with his tower, you can see that his left hand is on top of the pyramids. That's the height of the pyramids. The Eiffel Tower is incomparably higher than even the tallest of the pyramids. It also was taller, almost twice as tall as any other building uh, in existence at the time. If you look at that little card that you could buy, and send home to your family and so on. You, you can see in the middle it's a little bit fuzzy, but in the middle is the Washington Monument in, uh, in Washington, which was the next tall, it would be the next tallest building in the world. But the Eiffel Tower outstrips all of them. And in exhibitions, size always mattered. Every exhibition needed a showstopper, every, and every showstopper had to be bigger, had to be more uh, novel, more imposing than any that had gone before. So in the centennial exhibition of 1876 in Philadelphia, it mattered that the huge Corliss steam engine towered over even dignitaries as important as the, the American president, Ulysses Grant, and the emperor of Brazil. They were dwarfed by this machine. In 1878, when you took your ride on the great balloon, this is a tethered balloon that would take you up 500, 600 meters above Paris. When you uh, went up in that balloon, you uh, had the satisfaction of seeing, of course, a view of Paris that nobody had ever seen before. Um, you could even, in fact, win, come away with a little medal that you could buy to show, to prove that you'd actually done it. Uh, but what the, the real satisfaction was that you'd been in the balloon that was the biggest ever made, ever made in the world. And of course, in, in Chicago in 1893, it was the size of the Ferris wheel, this uh, innovation in 1893, that made it so special. Or take 
the showstopper of the 1900 exhibition in Paris. This is the Grand Lunette, the great telescope. Now this was, uh, it, it's hard to see, the, there are two images here, but along the top you can see the whole of the telescope sideways on. And the essence of the telescope is a huge tube, 60 meters long. And the idea is that if you look at the bottom image, you have a huge mirror called a siderostat. That would capture the image from the moon or whatever it was you were looking at from the heavens and would direct it along this immense tube and then it would be caught by the objective lens. And at the right-hand end, and that goes back to the top image, the image that you have, the image, and it was said you would see the moon as if you were only one meter away from the surface. It would be displayed on, on a screen. Well, this is a picture of the, of the thing. It was actually built. The only sad thing is it never worked. Didn't even come close to working. It was really one of the, I mean, one of the great disasters of uh, the history of science. Uh, all professional astronomers had ridiculed it. They said it's a complete waste of money. And uh, they'd always been against it right from the start, but it was built. Um, and of course, but nevertheless, I mean, in a way, it did its job. <clears throat> I think the exhibition organizers really thought that it, it, had, you know, it was easily the biggest telescope in the world. It was much bigger than the biggest one that had just been built in America, the Yerkes Telescope. Um, so the official exhibition literature sort of praised it, talked it up. <coughs> anyway, when you look at this succession of of uh, showstoppers, there is, I think, a pretty clear pattern. They were technologically more and more sophisticated. If you look at the, the moving pavement, the moving pavement of 1900 at the exhibition in Paris, um, what's important about the exhibition, what, what, about this pavement, of course, is that it's fun. There are two levels of the pavement. Uh, the, uh, the higher level moves at eight kilometers the hour, the lower one at four kilometers the hour, and of course you could step on and off and be taken right round the exhibition. Um, and behind that, of course, there is an enormous achievement, scientific and technological achievement. But of course those who rode the, the uh, moving pavement, they weren't bothered about how it worked. But I still would feel that even if the, sci the science, the technology was becoming more and more black boxed as you move on towards the end of the century, I think science was still conveying, still reinforcing that sense of progress. Um, and by now, science was at work on a completely different front. Since the 1880s, the, many of the countries that had been so anxious to proclaim their be belief in progress through electricity, engineering and so on, many of those countries had also pursued colonial interests. Now, there too, science came into its own. It came into its own in particular in the form of evolutionary ideas, Darwinian ideas, and the new science of anthropology. And again, it was a story of progress. And the story was, the official story was, of course, that we, uh, we the colonizing nations, we had progressed, whereas the supposedly primitive societies had been left way behind. And to make that point, uh, in the exhibition context, whole communities would be brought, in, brought from existing or potential colonies, and they were uh, implanted in the exhibitions to live for four, six months as exhibits. And visitors would pay to watch them, supposedly leading normal lives in recreated villages. Now, there'd always been, in all, right from the beginning, right from 1851, there'd always been a taste for the exotic, uh, this, in, in the Centennial Exposition in uh, Philadelphia, 1876, there was a Turkish bazaar and cafe. There'd been an Arab street in uh, Paris in 1878 and so on. Those, I think, were harmless enough. That was just sort of rather exotic tourism. They were fun. You might even say they were educational. But as the great colonial powers scrambled to colonize, especially to colonize Africa, through the 1880s and 1890s, the tone changed. 
what were variously called human showcases, human zoos, they were now routine parts of exhibitions. Sometimes they'd be at the, the sort of formerly part of the central exhibition, sometimes they'd be on the fringes, a sort of uh, entertainment, if you like, but wherever they were, they conveyed the essential, simple message, the simple message of Western cultural superiority. It all began <coughs> with the Dutch. They had a Javanese village at their Amsterdam expedition in 1883. By 1889 in Paris there were 400 indigenous people on show and many more than that in Chicago in 1893. And there you could pay, this is Chicago 93, there you could pay your 25 cents to see the Dahomey village. You would see 30 houses, 69 uh, vill uh, villages, and you were told, and this was the great attraction, almost a third of those villagers were warriors. They were headhunters. They were dangerous, exotic people. Or in Buffalo in 1901, or well, the Louisiana uh, Purchase uh, Exhibition in St. Louis three years later, 1904, you might prefer the Filipino village. 1,200 Filipinos in St. Louis living supposedly normal lives, though in reality, of course, they were performing uh, their carefully orchestrated uh, dances, war dances, religious ceremonies, and so on, at appointed times when the public would pay extra because there was this supplement. And everything was planned to bring out the nakedness, the aggressiveness, the primitive behavior. So primitive, and here you can see a bunch of, uh, of white visitors watching uh, these are Filipinos actually eating a dog. That was seen as the ultimate in, uh, as, as, as evidence of um, uh, primitive behavior, but of course it isn't in reality at all. The message you were meant to come away with was clear. In the struggle between races, according to the principles of social Darwinism, the Filipinos were condemned to inferiority, and this is a crucial extension, just as within the USA, I'm talking here mainly about the Chicago, Buffalo, St. Louis ex exhibitions, within the, US, uh, within the USA, also, you African Americans, Native Americans, they were likewise condemned to inferiority, inferiority and servitude. And the Filipinos' only hope, and this also comes out in the exhibition, particularly in St. Louis, 1904, the only hope for them was to accept American colonial rule and to submit to American, the American civilizing mission. And that was dispensed by a rather extraordinary woman about whom we know next to nothing, a certain Mrs. Wilkins. And at the Louisiana uh, Purchase Exhibition 1904, Mrs. Wilkins taught the Igorot boy, this is a um, Filipino boy, uh, to dance the cakewalk. Uh, and of course, it shows what you could do. You might even, she also taught them to sing. You might even be able to teach them to sing. I mean, it, it isn't an extraordinary episode in our history, I think, but there it is. That seems to be what happened. Well, when you'd, if you came away with the feeling that perhaps all was not lost for the P Filipinos, that perhaps America could help them on their way in this sort of Darwinist way to uh, a higher level, as they would have said at the time, uh, you might come away with a feel-good factor, a sense of, of, of well-being. Some people, though, didn't feel so good. Some people had never felt good about exhibitions. They were always contested right from the start. Remember the protest against the Eiffel Tower? Or think of the former slave and campaigner for the rights of the African-Americans, Frederick Douglass, Douglas, of course, found these human zoos absolutely abhorrent. Henry James, in his rather sort of lofty way, asked, 
what impression the Chicago exhibition would leave on the human mind. And, of course, the, the answer for him was it would leave a pretty awful and degrading impression. And Tolstoy, even uh, Tolstoy, who read about the exhibition, but he didn't go to it, described it in his diary as a striking example of hypocrisy and imprudence, an exercise in profit and amusement. Tolstoy was totally damning, and the worst for Tolstoy was that this, these motives uh, were concealed by the falsely noble aims that were ascribed to the exhibition. It's coming back to the, that point about exhibition rhetoric. And Tolstoy said, if you want to have fun, there are better ways of doing it. He ends up his little comment by saying, orgies are much more fun. Um, <clears throat> And yet, you know, the, sum, the, number of, the sheer number of exhibitions that I mentioned earlier on suggests that they worked. You know, there was exhibitions all over, all over the world. They served a purpose. They served many purposes. Right up to 1914, in fact, cities competed to host exhibitions. Nations competed to have their display well-placed in an exhibition. And both hosts and visiting nations expended huge sums to present the best possible image of themselves. And the public flocked to these exhibitions. They were unquestionably popular. The war, the Great War of 1914-18, was to change everything. When science and technology had done so much to promote four years of slaughter, human misery, could science really be seen as the fount of human progress? Could it be seen as a culture? It was often said before 1914, science was a culture that somehow transcended national boundaries and, trad and traditions. But could that really be true now after the 1914-18 war? Could those universalist ideals, dreams, values, could they really survive? Could exhibitions survive? And that's where I want to come now. Many said absolutely not. Many said these were dinosaurs. They were doomed to extinction. <clears throat> After all, there were lots of other ways in which you could do what you would expect to do at an exhibition. You could, uh, you could now travel. There were fun fairs. You could go to the cinema to, or to learn about foreign countries and so on. And if any nation wanted really to show it was superior to another, there was always, every four years, the Olympic Games. But they actually, exhibitions actually survived rather well. There were lots of them, and they survived, I think, because they were able to transform themselves into something different. Something much more limited, more focused, more thematic, in their coverage, they don't attempt, or fewer of them attempt to be universal in the old manner. Exhibitions changed in other ways as well. There were no more human, zoo, human zoos. The relationships between colonizing nations and colonial possessions, they changed after the First World War. It's the emphasis is much more on cooperation rather than on exploitation. Uh, and certainly with Britain, that was very marked, because Britain had been saved in the First World War, really, by the contributions of the colonies. And therefore, there was this sense in Britain that actually we owed a great deal to the colonies and that we should not be in any way seen to be exploiting them. <coughs> what about progress after the war? Well, the word survived. But it tended to give way to a new watchword, which was modernity. And I don't think that was quite the same thing. If you wanted to endorse the idea of progress, you needed the past. You needed to present the process as a sort of continuing pattern. You, want, you, you wanted the present to be a sort of bridge between the past and the future. That, that's how McKinley in Buffalo, Sadi Carnot in Paris in 1889, they look back to the accumulated achievements of the 19th century. Modernity, I think, implied a much, not so much a, a developmental pattern, it was rather a break, a turning away from the past. And 
Um, I'm hesitant to venture on Brazilian territory, but uh, it has been suggested in a recent article by an Anglo-Brazilian scholar, Livia Resende, it has been suggested that your uh, exhibition of 1922 uh, was partly um, expressed this new form of modernity, and she illustrates that point, and I, d I really can't say how plausible it is, though it actually would suit me if it were to be true as a historian, uh, by looking at the way that the um, Castello Hill was, uh, was sort of dug away uh, in the preparations for the, for the Rio exhibition of 1922. Uh, in the process, old buildings disappear and new, modern, future buildings, if you like, um, appear in their place. But I think that this determination to look ahead and rather obliterate the past, that's best illustrated uh, a bit later in the Depression years of the 1930s. Now, you might have expected that the crash of 18, 1929, the Depression years that followed, you might have expected that they would really finish off exhibitions for good. That would really be the end. But as Robert Rydell has argued in this book, he puts together, he treat, discusses in this book the so-called Century of progress uh, exhibitions. And there were several of them right through the 1930s up to uh, the USA's entry into the Second World War. Um, and these, this is Rydell's argument, is that these seem to have occurred and been mounted, not despite the financial and other difficulties of the Depression, but as a response to it because of the Depression. And on Rydell's analysis, these exhibitions reaffirmed a faith in science and technology as the way to salvation. Uh, not science and technology something we should thank for, its, for their past successes, because the past really wasn't looking very successful in the 1930s. But science and technology would be seen for the promise and promoted for the promise they held for the future. The problem was uh, to determine which type of society, which type of government, which type of politics was best suited to manage that passage to the future. It could be in the USA. Well, they were clear the passage was uh, going to be achieved through Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, in other words, investment in roads, dam projects, and so on. They would be government investment in modernizing projects. The new totalitarian powers, though, they had other ideas. And through the 30s, you see uh, fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia. You see them all using exhibitions to advance their particular visions of modernity and how modernity should be managed. Nowhere more dramatically than in 1937, in Paris, this was the international exhibition. You see it across the top. It's not actually complete. The, the words really are international exhibition of arts and te techniques. Dans la vie moderne, in, the modern, in modern life, if you like. This is very much an exhibition about modernity in the way I've just tried to define modernity, this new vision of modernity. The French, of course, were proclaiming, they mounted the exhibition, they were proclaiming their own leadership in this new, uh, sort of technologically, scient scientifically driven world. But those claims were actually lost. They came to be eclipsed in a way that, in the end, was really very embarrassing for uh, the French. Uh, because what happened was other nations came, but they came with really pretty aggressive intent, particularly Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. And one of the famous images of this exhibition of 1937, this is a, a photograph taken from the Chaillot Hill, if any of you know that in Paris, looking down towards the Seine, is this image of the Eiffel Tower in the middle, flanked on the right-hand side by the Soviet pavilion, and on the left-hand side by the German Nazi pavilion. And these were the two powers that mattered. 
They were the powers that were making statements about the future, about modernity. And you get the impression, I mean, if you want to sort of read into that picture a sort of symbolism, you'd almost say that the Eiffel Tower is the sort of symbol of the past, of the old technology, of a France that had failed by not having, any, well, for several years now, not having any really stable government. And of course, what the implication was, and indeed it was displayed inside, on the right, the Soviet Union, on the left, Nazi Germany, would show you how a properly ordered uh, uh, society, ordered according to their different conceptions, obviously, how a properly ordered society would lead the world into the new era of modernity. These are the two, uh, the two pavilions, the German one with the eagle on the top, the Soviet one with the image of a factory worker, a male factory worker, and a female peasant, I suppose, might even have been the, use, the word used at the time uh, on, the, on top of the, the, Soviet, the Soviet pavilion. Well, the effect was, I mean, no, nobody could, could sort of miss what this was all about, what, 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 what was being said. There was this conflict. Certainly somebody who didn't uh, miss the point was Mussolini. Oh, I sh sorry, I should have just said inside. These are the two inside exhibitions. The top one is the Nazi one, the German one. They place the emphasis on high refined technology. There's a Mercedes racing car. There's a Carl Zeiss exhibition towards the back. The Soviet exhibition put the emphasis on the people's car, for example, not a racing car, but on the people's car. Well, Mussolini uh, was in, th in on the act in no time, and he planned an exhibition for eight, uh, 1942. This was the 20th anniversary of the March on Rome, and would, of course, applaud the fascist achievements in Italy. Plans for this exhibition actually went ahead long, bef well before the war began, and some of the buildings are still there to be seen in Rome. But for obvious reasons, the 1942 exhibition never happened. War came, <coughs> and I come back to the question that I raised with regard to the First World War. Surely exhibitions could not survive yet again. But they did. They have survived, and some of them, at least, are doing rather well. Some of them have left buildings that we're maybe familiar with. The, uh, it is the, on the left is the Atomium. It's a, a relic of the Brussels exhibition of 1958. There's the Skyline Tower at the uh, Seattle, which is a relic of the, ex the Seattle exhibition of 1962. Certainly, these are all about modernity. They're all about looking to the future. But I think where perhaps they're different, in, in that sense, I suppose they are a continuation of the exhibitions of the 1930, those Century of Progress exhibitions. But I think they are different because they look, certainly are preoccupied with modernity, the future, but I think they look to, um, look on, not, they don't see modernity as a solution to our various problems. They tend to see modernity as a challenge. And I think that you can see that in the themes that are being adopted for the more recent exhibitions. I mean, the uh, Brussels exhibition of 1958 was, uh, the theme was nuclear power. And I think it was a response to anxieties about the effect of the nuclear age that was just dawning in the 1950s. The Seattle one was about the space age. How is that going to change our world? If you look at the most recent of the exhibitions, the big exhibitions in Milan in 2015, it was about feeding the planet. And I think that that approach, in other words, to see modernity not in a sort of triumphalist way, as might have been the case at one time, not as something holding out unlimited and undiscussable, I mean, uh, undeniable benefit for the future, but modernity as a problem that we need to address in society. I think that is a quite astute way in which exhibitions have remodeled themselves. So exhibitions, even in our own day, have shown their capacity to change. And so 
If they really are dinosaurs, as many people said they were a century ago, it strikes me they are pretty lively, sprightly dinosaurs. I'm always reticent about drawing lessons from history, but I think if the history of exhibitions tells us anything at all, I think it is that despite a century of questioning, of contestation and so on, these particular dinosaurs might have a pretty bright future after all. Thank you, Professor Fox. O Professor Fox vai uh, agora aceitar perguntas. Uh, se quiserem, pode fazer em inglês, senão nós traduzimos. Uh, nós vamos pedir só para se identificar, porque isso está sendo gravado. Uh, uh, good morning. <laughs> uh, my name is Priano. I'm a professor at a federal university here. Um, thank you for the lecture. I had one doubt. You mentioned the, the, the lunette that they built. Um, I wonder who were uh, responsible for that? Were like scientists involved? Like who sponsored? Uh, the, that kind of uh, instrument, that kind of thing. The Grand Lunette, uh, well, <laughs> that was a ministry of, that would be, the, at that time would be the Ministry of Public Instruction, and so it was a ministerial project with certain, certainly they took uh, advice from astronomers, uh, that, that is true. Um, but I think that the consensus in the what you might call the professional astronomical community that this was far too big, for example. I mean, what, what really went wrong with it? I mean, in principle, it is rather a grand idea. The individual parts are magnificent. I mean, that sidereostat is still, still preserved and still exhibited as a masterpiece of mirror making. Uh, so the individual elements, I think, were perfect. I think where it went wrong was that in order to get government, governmental support, this was an immensely uh, costly project, I think in that case it had to be made available to the public. It had to be a public event. And if you look at that 60-meter uh, tube, there was a gallery all along, and the public could walk along. <clears throat> and so you find that the temperature, the temperature gradients, the temperature is irregular, there are vibrations. So the sort of things that I think a professional astronomer would have said, you must absolutely not have. You mustn't have people near this thing. You mustn't have vibration, etc. That was just overruled. So I think that as far as I can see, there was a debate between, I mean, professional astronomers were quite attracted by the idea to have the biggest telescope in the world. But they lost, it seems to me, they lost control to the ministerial lobby, if you like. And that ended in... I mean, they managed to get a few sort of rather poor images of, of the moon, but it, almost nothing. And then it was dismantled afterwards. Thank you. So my, my name is Edison. I'm a postdoc researcher at the Department of Sociology here in the university. And I have a question about our contemporary time and our contemporary life and the, the role played by the media. Uh, I would like to know if it would be possible to say that nowadays the media is kind of playing the role of uh, these exhibitions in the sense that uh, the media is uh, building up these discourses about science and technology and uh, spreading the expectations about science and technology. Mm. Well, I think, I think that's a very, a very good point. I think the, me the media, of course, in the period I was talking about, the media were far less uh, visible. 
Um, I think it's absolutely true. There is a tendency to build up science and technology. I think also a tendency to expect too much of science and technology. But of course, on the media, certainly in Britain, we, we, would, we would have a sector of our media that would be somewhat suspicious of science and technology. So I think, uh, certainly looking at it from the British perspective, I would say the media is a, an arena in which uh, there is um, conflict, opposition, though it's certainly true, and I would agree with you, that I think the media overwhelmingly will um, expect science and technology to, uh, to solve our problems. And of course, what I do feel about the media in Britain, I don't know how true it would be here, is that the understanding uh, that's conveyed in the media is really very limited. Uh, there is the, the, the media, I think, find it very difficult to get round the idea that um, scientific knowledge is so uh, provisional that uh, that we 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 evolve and uh, you'll hear any number of announcements about some treatment for alzheimer's disease for example and what the uh, the researchers have actually said is that this treatment has had some modest effect in certain conditions etc cetera, etc cetera. but that will immediately appear in the popular press uh, as we now have, or we're now on the way to a cure for <laughs> Alzheimer's disease. So I think in that respect, I think the media confuses the messages coming out of the scientific, medical, technological community in a terrible way. Well, my name is Luis Venturi. I'm a professor here at the Department of Geography. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for your brilliant talk. Uh, well, uh, considering that I, here in academy, the role of techniques and technology is giving empirical support to our scientific researches, but at the same time, the more problems we solve and exhibit, uh, the more new pro problems we face, according to the principle of uh, growing complexity. So, having said that, my question precisely is, uh, would you think that science is always lagging behind the reality it wants explain due to the fact that techniques and technology they develop much faster and change the world much more rapidly than we can understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me that our concepts here in academy are constantly losing accuracy uh, facing to the, the reality in terms of the, the facts they want to explain. Mm. I mean, do you, you feel that when you say academy, I imagine you're talking about the sort of what we do call the pure science research that's being done in universities, that, that, that sort of, a, you mean academy in that sense. I mean, yeah. if, if, if I think science is lagging behind, well, all I think I can say is that my sense is that Again, I can really only talk about Britain or Europe. My sense is that there is a, a resolve to try to get the science and techniques, if you like, to, to work together and to be at the same level. But I think you're right. The natural tendency is almost for the, for the engineering, the technology to move ahead and science to be s somehow separate, whether it's behind or... I, I'm not sure, but I think the important thing, the great challenge, it seems to me, for, particularly for the last half century, has been how can we bring, keep those two worlds in step? I mean, I like your idea of there being, in a way, um, a sort of difference in, chron almost chronological difference, if you like. Mm -hmm. But I think somehow we do need to keep that, uh, that dialogue going. And uh, yes. I have been sort of 
I wouldn't say involved, but certainly have seen from fairly close quarters some projects which deliberately really did try to do that. Mm. Um, in France, in the 80s, actually when I was working there in Paris, there was a, a government agency called Anvar, A-N-V-A-R, and that, that was to make get scientists and engineers really working together um, mm. and get the scientists responding to technological challenges and so on. What's interesting is that Anvar has disappeared now, or almost disappeared, which would suggest that this marriage is actually more difficult than one might imagine. Yeah, because uh, I think the rhythm is very different. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, many of our colleagues, they, they, they think that science is in anticipating ah. the reality. Mm. But I, I am not convinced that. Yeah. I, I'm convinced that science is always lagging behind, mm. trying to explain the reality mm outside that move much faster than we uh, move our things in, in our, our concepts. Yeah. Well, I, I, I welcome that comment. I mean, uh, certainly in some work I've done in the history of technology, I've tried to insist um, on the, the notion, the category of technologically driven science. In other words, science that has been driven by technology, whereas historians of technology on the whole, will tend to talk, see the other way around. In other words, they would see um, scientifically driven technology. I, I, I prefer the concept of technologically driven science, or indeed the two. I mean, it may be that in certain sectors, scientifically driven technology is appropriate, but I think the other one is, for me, is more real. So thank you very much. Thank you for your inspiring lecture. I'm Sara Obieri, I teach here at the Department of History. I would like just to share something that occurred to me during your presentation. You mentioned the key idea of progress uh, being the main concept along many of the exhibition's history. Mm. Uh, that happened during a century or so. And then the recent ones would be instead uh, reacting to the idea of modernity. Mm. And I was wondering if progress is something that uh, suggests uh, we are now in control, mm. making things work. Mm. and modernity would be something that happens to us <laughs> and we are trying to react to it or mm. keep up with it and uh, accidentally uh, the feeling my colleague just expressive of mm. being left behind mm. or <laughs> trying to keep up with reality might uh, be in accordance with this right. I, uh, feeling I just had. I would like to you listen to you right. about that. Um, I mean, in a way, uh, we have to, as historians, you have to create categories and so on, to, as a, to just for heuristic purposes more than anything. doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth. But uh, I think the, the progress up, up to the First World War, I think there was this feeling that what was happening was a sort of organic, n n natural process. There would be progress. We could stop it by making bad decisions or something, but basically progress would go on. Then I think, in the, particularly in the 30s, you get this idea of modernity, technology, uh, holding out a future for us, but we did need to manage it. We had to control it. It would happen but we did need to make sure it happened in the right way. And now we seem to be in the phase of saying, well, you know, this modernity business, it's, um, it, 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 it's dangerous, you know, it, it, has, it has dangers for us. And really, the, I, I'm quite encouraged by these recent exhibitions, actually. I mean, whether they convey the material very well is another matter, but the, the very thought that you are just saying, Modernity is a big problem, you know, and we need to marshal our efforts. Even in science fiction, 
just a second at the mic. <laughs> I was thinking about science fiction, movie fictions, mm -hmm. like when, when the, the machines will take over, we yes. have to control yes. that. Yeah. Uh, modernity can mm. make its space without us. Mm. Yes. Well, I think there was one, I can't remember which of the recent exhibitions was, you know, really about precisely that, the, how do we survive the age of the modern machine, today's machine. Yes. Hello, thank you for your talk. My name is Sibeli Silva. I'm from Institute of Physics of São Carlos at University of São Paulo. Uh, my, my thoughts are related to, to hers. And uh, I wonder how the, how, the pu how the public perception of science involved in the exhibitions changed along the se more than a century. Mm. Um, in the first exhibitions, it was more related to big machines that the public could have a clue about uh, what's going on, yeah. about science. And the modern uh, or the contemporary exhibitions are more on biotech or mm. computers, computer science, uh, artificial intelligence, things like that. And I wonder, uh, I would like to listen from you about this shift and also if it's related to this kind of fear that we we have because the we are creating troubles perhaps a machine can control us and things like that and we don't understand the, mm. the general public uh, doesn't understand what's going on on um, nuclear level mm. or on molecular level mm. or yeah. spintronics and things like that. I think you're right. It's an, uh, th there is a new problem that's, that's emerged. Um, it seems to me that you certainly find even in the 19th century that the technology is getting black box so that it's, it's harder to see what actually is happening in, in a machine. That's certainly true. But I do think that uh, it's a, it really a question of the smallness, I think, of our, of our modern technology. And it's precisely a nanotechnology and the biotech industry. That, that's where I think there's a feeling that we've lost some sort of insight, some sort of window onto, onto what, it, what is actually happening. And I think it's probably uh, significant that, as, I'm sorry, I only can speak from the British point of view here, but that we started in the 1980s a public understanding of science movement. Um, and this was something new in the 1980s, and I think it responded to a feeling of um, divorce between the scientific community and the general public. Because what the scientific public, uh, the scientific community was finding was that the general public was becoming very suspicious of science, and I think it's for precisely the reason that you uh, say. It, it, you can't see what's going on. The issues in biotech or, or nanotechnology and so on they are so advanced and esoteric. I mean, you can see how a steam hammer works. It's, it's pretty easy. You know, to make one would be quite difficult, but the principle is, 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 is easy. And I think in the 1980s, this, our public understanding of science movement, which was very, very vigorous for several years, I think it responded to precisely this feeling of helplessness, divorce, on the part of the general public from the scientific community. The scientific community, for their part, realized that they were losing public support. And after all, they had to go to government in order to have a laboratory built or whatever. And I think, therefore, the public understanding of science movement was a res it actually uh, served both constituencies, the general public and the scientific community. I just had one comment there on public understanding, and that is it seems to me that the scientists, the scientific community, took possession of the public understanding of science movement uh, initially. And I think that what the result was something rather unsatisfactory. Namely, it tended to be the scientific community telling you, 
explaining to you how science worked. Well, that, that's good. Of course, it's, it's good. But there wasn't, there wasn't a sense of dialogue. And I think now in recent public understanding exercises, it's much more a question of an exchange with the scientific community. I think genuinely listening to lay opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mais alguma pergunta? Yes. Uh, my name is Diogenes uh, Alves. I'm from the Space Research Institute. And I really enjoyed one of your points is that we are kind of moving from exhibitions which would see modernity as something very uh, uh, well associated with the ideas of progress, maybe emancipation and uh, all that. And then you uh, said that today we don't see uh, exhibitions as something that present modernity as a solution, but uh, we are maybe moving uh, toward a discussion about what are the challenges of uh, modernity. Uh, I, I, I really like that because uh, to me, it sounded like you are making a, 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 a very strong uh, point here. We are really moving from the idea of emancipation, salvation maybe, to the one of discussing what are the challenges for mm -hmm. humanity, not just for modernity maybe. Uh, is that really what you are stating and then the second issue uh, that uh, impresses me is that when you are talking about challenges, you are also talking about who defined what is to be considered a challenge. Mm. And then you are kind of moving away from the very idea of emancipation. Mm. I'm not sure if you could uh, react on that. Right. I'm just trying to point at the contradiction right. that we all, we, we all live. Yes. Thank you. Well, uh, the point that you outline, I think, is precisely the one I would want to make. Um, and that's why I find these latest exhibitions really rather encouraging. You'd, uh, you'd expect these things to, die, to have died by now. But I think they found a new function, which is a function that responds to a need an express need in, in society. Uh, there is then the problem, of course, as you say, of who defines exactly what the challenges are. I think, is that your anxiety, isn't it? Where, um, in that sense that it, it isn't, um, I mean, you'd like to think that somehow uh, the public can enter naively into this uh, dialogue. I think that that is that is the problem that uh, you, uh, and I think in the public understanding of science movement that that was precisely the problem. How can you somehow be sure that you have an open forum, but a forum in which informed opinion actually carries special weight, uh, and an informed opinion can in some way guide. I think it's exactly what you're saying. Guide the real the real problems that, that need discussion. And it may be that we're actually not very good at that. Um, because as you say, in a way, it sort of slightly undermines the whole democratic notion of this debate, if, if that's what we're hoping to achieve. Well, actually, what I think is that uh, a problem about the discussion. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my 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 uh, main preoccupation is that uh, how to link the idea of modernity with the 
old idea, modern idea of emancipation. And there, if we have only informed people uh, in the capacity, so it's just a contradiction mm -hmm. of the very idea of modernity, of yeah. emancipation. Yeah. How to get to emancipation if the whole process of defining challenges to, to, to follow just the idea of challenges mm -hmm. uh, is prescribed to be defined by only informed people? Yeah. Well, I think the... I think that question probably, I mean, you put it particularly elegantly and sharply, I think, but I think it was sort of moving around in the early public understanding of science movement because you had this very specialized esoteric scientific community that was telling the public what the problems were, what the advantages were, usually speaking in support of science because they were after public money. I mean, in a way, it was their job to do that. Um, and I think that we needed then, and to some extent, I, or I'm sure we still need, people who somehow are not quite of the scientific community but can talk, talk their language. And they have to be sort of intermediaries for the rest of us who can't really hope to have access to that. I mean, one of our problems, I don't know, I wonder if it is a problem in Brazil, one of our problems in our government in our civil service, in our parliament, is that there are very, very few people with a scientific background in, in that world. Uh, and that is a real problem. So that you will hear debates in parliament which betray the most astonishing ignorance of the, you know, the most basic scientific uh, knowledge. I'm not talking about being a, a specialist, but really the most... Um, astonishing uh, things that c can, can be said um, and we've never really I, I think it, it's o we often think of it as a British disease namely that there's this sort of rather um, respect special respect for humanities literature language the, the more refined arts if you like and there is this sort of rather secondary culture of science and technology to some extent. I mean, we've, we've worked against that for, for decades now, but I think there is, certainly when it comes to a, the, the sort of the civil service, the high administration, when it comes to parliament, I think that sort of cultural divide is still there. You know, C.P. Snow talked about it in the 1950s, and everybody says, oh, C.P. Snow, he didn't really understand things. But I can't help feeling that there's an, a grain of truth in what he was saying, because it's about British society, our prejudices uh, against science, against technology, and in favor of more literary things and so on. Mm -hmm. But then you go to France and they say, oh, well, we're, we're the same. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Brazil, mm. you're the same. No, no, <laughs> not maybe. Not maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if it was British, it caught on and spread very fast. Well, it's, it's yes, it's catching, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. May I ask a question, too? Oh, of course. <laughs> uh, when you mentioned the, uh, uh, the Brazilian exposition mm. of it, uh, 1922, it reminded me that I once worked with the Brazilian catalogs for the uh, um, universal expeditions in the uh, 19th century. Mm. And uh, for example, the 1876 uh, exposition in Philadelphia, the catalog for the Brazilian products that were in the exit uh, showed practically m more than 95% of them were related to raw material and things like uh, um, sugar, cane, alcohol. More than 1,000 brands of uh, cachaça. But it struck me that one thing that was in the Brazilian stand was a modern ship propeller. Mm. Uh, w which uh, had, in fact, it appeared to me that he had better aero uh, fluid dynamical properties. Yeah. And, and, and then I said, well, what was r the real content of uh, Brazilian technique at that time? We had no university, 
but we had some people working in things that were related to, uh, to progress. So uh, maybe this uh, universal exhibitions served that purpose of showing not only the exotic, in our case, the sugar cane alcohol, but also something that was practically hidden, uh, even for the Brazilian society. So th the exhibition in Philadelphia showed something to Br to the Brazilians themselves. Y yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Well, I can, and and of course that's uh, that, that's uh, aspect of Brazilian uh, displays afterwards. I think becomes quite marked. If you look at the eighteen eighty nine exhibition, then the uh, the eighteen eighty nine exhibition Brazil pre presents itself as a modern mm -hmm. country with with. Mm -hmm technological exhibits, I think. Um, but yeah, and you're, you could be speaking to people back home. In yes. other words. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice thought. Okay. More questions? Uh, bem, então, se não há mais perguntas, nós vamos dar para encerrado, uh, agradecendo novamente o professor Robert Fox. E, e logo depois do almoço começam as apresentações dos trabalhos em sessões simultâneas. Os nossos monitores vão indicar onde serão eh, cada uma das sessões. Então, até mais tarde.